Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. This is another in our ongoing webinar series, uh, 3D Printing in the Workplace and STEM Education. And this session is 3D Modeling Design Jam, using prompts to create. And before we get started, I'm going to hand it over to our hosts, who are uh, Kevin Smith and Andy Halverson, both of whom are with Bitspace. Kevin is the uh, Vice President and Creative Director, and Andy is the STEAM Integration Specialist, uh, both of them on the Bitspace team. Before we uh, hand things over to them, I want to let you know that you are welcome to submit questions throughout this session. I would ask that you use the chat function to do that as opposed to the Q&A panel, if you don't mind. And the only reason we're asking that is because, for whatever reason, the Zoom webinar platform does not give us logs of the Q&A as part of the recording. It only gives us logs of the chat. So use the chat. We have it set up so that only we, the panelists, will see your chat messages. So I would ask that when you submit questions through the chat, please include your email address the first time that you send a message. And that way, if we need to follow up with you after the fact, we can do so. None of the other attendees will see those messages, so your email address won't be exposed. So please use the chat as you'd like throughout the session, and uh, we'll do our best to answer those questions either during or after. So with that, I'm very pleased to hand it over to Kevin Smith. Kevin, take it away. All right, hi. Um, hi everybody, my name is Kevin Smith and I am the uh, creative director here at Bitspace. Um, actually glad my video isn't enabled just yet because uh, I don't know about anybody else, but I've got um, a little bit of a not had my hair cut in a month kind of vibe going. So uh, I'm delighted to be here though, but um, you know, what we're going to be doing today is kind of exploring um, some modeling software in the way that uh, we like to introduce it to kids and campers in our workshops and in our summer camp programs. Um, so, you know, we've kind of discovered over the years that um, some of these, um, some of these software platforms that were, you know, they're meant for professionals and industry specialists to be using to do their day to day jobs. Um, are just as exciting and just as um, intuitive to use in the hands of kids to execute ideas. And one of the kind of foundations of Bitspace was this idea that, um, you know, kids' minds are just, they're more, more plastic than ours. And when it comes to learning new software, they just get excited about it. Um, rather than kind of the fear and dread of maybe having to learn something new, they're a little bit more of the what's this button do kind of people. And it was so awesome to see how fast some of these kids would just pick up on this, this uh, information. And the next thing you know, we're all inventing things together. And so the, the software that we've kind of found the most interest in has been uh, Fusion 360, um, namely because it is a industrial design tool that is incredibly versatile and it's um, very intuitive. It's a lot of kind of e easy to understand user interface where you're not necessarily punished for not knowing hotkeys, uh, which is always a lovely thing when you're getting started with uh, a new program. Um, but it also seems to kind of have infinite potential. And there's something kind of amazing about being able to, you know, design a something to be 3D printed uh, and design something to be milled on a CNC mill or folded as sheet metal or printed to a circuit board, all in one like kind of software like home. So I'm super excited to kind of share how we like to explore software here at Fitspace. And uh, we're going to be doing that with uh, Andy Halverson, who uh, is our STEAM integration specialist. And um, if you want to go ahead and say hello, I will check in about getting my camera turned on. Absolutely. Uh, hello. Uh, as Kevin said, I'm Andy Halverson. I'm the STEAM integration specialist here at Fitspace. Uh, so I work a lot with teachers helping to make uh, all of these projects meaningful uh, and actually applying them to a lot of the standards that teachers are already focusing on. Uh, so just giving it a little bit more meaning uh, while having a boatload of fun diving into these programs, uh, learning carpentry, electronics, what have you. Um, but yeah, my favorite uh, part about Fusion 360 and uh, digital modeling is it's an opportunity to show um, additive as well as um, subtractive uh, making uh, in the same uh, medium uh, or software so that students are able to say, oh, okay, if I add this and this and this, I can get an awesome product. Or if I start with a block, I could chisel away at it and get my desired result. 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, and you know, it's it's really important too that um, we we kind of we use some of the creative freedom and sort of camp mentality to explore really meaningful ideas too. Um, you know, you'll, you'd never imagine how many ideas start with farts are funny and turn <laughs> into air pollution sensors and, um, you know, turn into a serious subject. If you just give it a second to wonder about how you can tie this into a meaningful approach to design. And it turns out there's a huge world out there of improv that's available for getting a learning objective met. Um, and one of our favorite things to do is kind of build things with those ideas. So we're going to give that a shot today. Um, and we're going to start um, kind of just, we're going to throw it all out there and start from scratch. So yep. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. And uh, again, I like to live on the edge and just share the entire screen. So we'll, we'll see how that goes. Um, but uh, I wanted to kind of represent a couple ideas. Uh, about fusion as we kind of get into this, uh, just to sort of feature some of the really cool and quality capabilities of the software that might be different from um, something you're more comfortable with, like uh, Tinkercad or even Rhino 3D. Um, if some of you have been using the NURBS modeler of the future ever since 2004, um, you know, there's these fantastic programs out there that are actually there's a lot of similarities between how we operate in Fusion. It just takes it um, this really interesting kind of um, parametric light step forward. And let me just show you what I mean. Um, so let's, I'm just going to create like a simple object here because I don't want to kind of like buy a ton of time with this. Um, but you know, we'll make like a 12 by 12 by 12 little cube. Um, kind of zoom in so we can see it. And I'll cover kind of like what's happening right now in just a second. But um, one of these things that is really exciting about how this software works is um, it's, it's integrated. There's a history option where it goes beyond the control Z. Um, as much as I love, I would love having a control Z button in my everyday life. Um, Fusion has shown me there's a better way. There's, there's this kind of like, are you sure you wanted to do that button? Which is super cool. Uh, and let's just, um, you know, let's just kind of set this up here uh, in a way that uh, makes sense. So I'm going to go ahead and make a whole bunch of these guys. A rectangular pattern of this guy, right? Where do we want that pattern to go? Let's have it go in that direction. Let's have it go in this direction. Okay, cool. I'm happy with that, except like, oh, barnacles, right? This thing is way too big. I actually meant it to be a two by two by two cube. Um, you know, what would I do in normal circumstances, right? Undo, maybe start over. Uh, Fusion allows us to edit kind of the history of our work at any time um, by going back and just kind of taking a peek into the past, changing it, and then going back to the future, right? It's, it's awesome. Um, and so we don't really lose our progress. We get to kind of iterate back and forth um, and even like set up parameters that might mean something to us. So rather than trying to enter all this information in over and over and over again, um, you know, it might be wise for me to, um, you know, set something up where I actually know how long something needs to be at any given time. Let's just say I want to make some novelty Star Wars ice cube trays <laughs> and I'm going to 3D print the form and then do a silicone cast of it. Um, so I can have like a baby Yoda ice cube because who wouldn't want that, right? <laughs> well, let's just say that like generally speaking, there's good ice cubes and there's bad ice cubes, right? And if you, you've ever tried to put an ice cube in an algae jar, you know what I'm talking about. Um, so let's just say the good ice cube is generally like one inch, um, right? The good ice, All right? So now I have a length um, and, you know, just to be fun, I'm going to, I'll make a width and maybe... I don't know, um, you know, those awesome cylindrical ones. Um, they're a little longer than they are wide. So I'll just leave a good ice too, right? Um, and eh, well, what else might I enter, right? Height, there we go. We'll just kind of say the height. So I can enter information into Fusion that means something to me um, and go back and instead of kind of crunching data all the time, 
Oops. It is case sensitive, Kevin. <laughs> there we go. Um, I can kind of start to tell Fusion what to do with uh, my own my own terminology. Um, and just out of curiosity, I'm going to see what happens if I uh, array it here as well. Um, yeah, let's do WD there. So, all right, that's interesting, right? My ice cube tray is getting a little condensed here. Uh, but here, let's just add a little bit of uh, math in here. So let's just do length times three, width times three. And now I've kind of got this parametrically adjustable thingamajigger of, of cubes, right? So if length and width change at any given time, let's just say um, those numbers uh, double, we'll go ahead and write no more extra work. So the, the parameters that I set in the model dynamically adjust to what I'm asking Fusion to do. And that's where it gets really exciting because it asks you to think a little bit more about how you're designing what you design. Um, and sure, there's still plenty of room to make an existing thing, right? If I want to make a phone case, I can just model my phone. It, it might not, I mean, it might not change for me right now. And in the moment, I just need to 3D print a phone case because that would be super fun. But what if I could design a phone case with enough parameters that I could future-proof the design of it by creating a table of the thickness, the width, the, the radius at which the curvature of the screen is. And every time a new phone comes out, I, I change five numbers and I've got a freshly designed product on my hands that I can put out into the world. Now that's kind of like a consumer facing solution to the problem. Uh, but it is to say that like there is an answer to all these questions. And it's really exciting to see software that kind of gets people's brains a little bit and starts to help you think forward and then th and, and react backwards without having to completely undo everything that you work towards. Um, so, you know, that's some of the kind of cool like features that kind of got me hooked on Fusion 360 was the, the um, approachability of being able to make really important changes that relate to each other. Um, and if you've used um, Grasshopper in Rhino, for instance, there's a lot, it, it kind of has the essence of that, right? It's the, um, I don't think like the, the the Cliff Notes version of, of something like Grasshopper or Dynamo, um, where it doesn't give you the privilege of, of creating your own like dynamic parameters. Uh, it kind of lets you change values and change um, history. But um, we didn't come here to make, well, maybe we did come here to make Yoda ice cream trays. I'm not sure yet. <laughs> but we came here we'll to design something that we don't even know we're going to design. So. I'm going to go ahead and close this out. Um, um, before we dive into that, there was one quick question um, in regards oh, yeah. to uh, tutorials that we would suggest uh, uh, for noobs uh, who are oh, new to absolutely. the program. Um, for one, um, Autodesk's uh, YouTube channel is an excellent treasure trove of really good quality content. Uh, even the stuff that is uh, five years old is still pretty relevant. Like, you know, some of the user interface might have changed. Um, but they have, uh, what I really like are these migration guides. So if you've ever used 3D modeling software in the history of everything, you don't necessarily have to start from the beginning because they're going to kind of be like, well, I mean, I didn't know what a cube is. Like, leave me alone. They've got these awesome guides. It's like, if you're a SolidWorks expert, they, you know, they've got this set of videos that'll try and hook you in and bring you into the fusion like kind of family. Um, and then if you're, you know, naturally using Tinkercad, um, they have some really approachable projects that kind of relate to some of how you use primitives and, and Boolean operations and things there. Um, but just their website and then, uh, or their, their YouTube channel, and then also their uh, learning and support desk on Fusion 360's own website is a kind of interactive, like sometimes animated, sometimes video clip wiki of anything you might want to ask. Uh, and that is incredible. Sometimes it's a little too deep. Like, it, you know, it'll give you a lot of information if you, if you try too hard. But if you have a question, it is likely answered there. And we'll include links to those um, in kind of our follow-up to these, uh, these webinars. 
Awesome, thank you. I also yeah. saw uh, Jeremy commented that uh, uh, 3D Universe has some awesome online curriculum uh, uh, in regards to Fusion 360, and he dropped the link in the chat. So feel free to check that resource out as well. Oh, excellent. Uh, well, that's great news. So Andy, what do you think? Should we try and um, create a project, right? I Yes, 100%. Right. Walk us through why we're about to get ourselves into what we're getting ourselves into. Okay, so <laughs> as as uh, any project begins, it of course is going to have uh, constraints or parameters um, or prompts. And what uh, this uh, this little card game is going to do is it's going to give us just that. Um, it's going to give us some prompts. It's going to give us some constraints, uh, and it might even give us some tools in Fusion that are going to sort of direct how we use the software. Um, now, the reason why we start uh, with these prompts is we we like to approach uh, these designs, specifically at Pitspace, uh, in a sort of whimsical manner. Um, it gives us the uh, the ability to meet kids where they're at, and as opposed to saying, oh, but, but, but how are we going to do that? Uh, we can first say, what if we can do that? And uh, start with a, like, a theater, yes, and how are we going to do that? Let's just go for it. And uh, the nice thing with Fusion is you can always say, oh, it doesn't quite work right now. How can we step back and make it work? Um, so we're going to start with the yes and uh, with this sweet card game that Kevin has pulled up now. All right. So I'm going to click for a new challenge. And um, let's see here. Design something that makes someone laugh that encloses something. Um, I don't know. That, I mean, that could be pretty much anything we make, you know, as long as we <laughs> stop about a half an hour before it's supposed to be done. Right. <laughs> um, but uh, we might be able to sesh that out. Um, but do, should we uh, should we click it, you know, a random set of times and see if I'd we can get something yeah. a little harder? Yeah. All right. Let's do. Let's see what we can get. Oh my. Okay. Design something that slows down or speeds things up. Mm. That is complex and odd. Ooh. Ooh. Hmm. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to post this link here into the chat as well. Nice. Um, you guys shouldn't, we shouldn't be the ones having all the fun. Um, this is an absolutely superb way to get ideas out into the world. Um, and the, you know, the idea of creating a user prompt, or in this case, like a functionality prompt, um, and then kind of tying that to parameters, like a parameter of complexity, or that it's, oh, in this case, odd means odd number, not odd as in um, an oddity. Gotcha. So that actually, that actually makes it, um, <laughs> that makes it uh, kind of, kind of entertaining. Um, and as I, as I came to that realization, the first thing that came to mind Mm. is um, a complex thing that slows down or speed things up would be like maybe our concept of time. Um, and this is I'm kind of throwing myself a softball here, but what if there were just odd numbers on a clock? What if our clocks only went to 11? Um, you know, how complicated would the gearing have to change on, mm. a, on an analog clock so that it still told accurate time, but now divi is a, a divisible of 22 or is 11? um but or, yeah i mean that one we, we could make an 11 11 number clock in like five minutes but of course um yeah. which uh you know maybe maybe we just kind of demonstrate that that's that's totally possible yeah start with um, start with something like that yeah so what i would do is um i am going to be working in a project for so um, our project is called Design Engine Challenges, uh, and it just contains kind of little sketches like the one we're about to do. Uh, so we have kind of a repository of every effort that we ultimately try to make when we do these kinds of things. Uh, so the first thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to save this untitled project. Uh, I'll do it by just, I'm just going to throw something in here so it has something to look at. And then I can save it as um let's take a look at that prompt again so gearhead complex and odd okay oh and not even 
<laughs> that, that one's gonna take me over the edge. I can feel yeah. it. All right. Okay. So again, we're kind of. Oh, that's exciting. Um, that little error message that you saw is uh, I, I've done something in the past that prevented one of my models from uploading, um, and uh, occasionally it just kind of gets stuck in a backlog. But uh, pay no mind; it'll figure itself out. Um, but now that I've got that that model created, right, and it's in the right place, I'm just going to go ahead and close this so we can see our screen a little bit more. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and just remove that that key because we don't really need it. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and talk about uh, sketching an idea out quite literally. So um, in the the create function of Fusion, when I kind of showed you the ice cube tray of the future, uh, we were just creating some solid objects. Uh, but in a lot of respects, you might want to start with um, a sketch, kind of like you would on a napkin or something like that, that helps get your idea across. And when you, whenever you click a button or select a tool, Fusion kind of asks you to do the same, the same couple of steps. Uh, so I selected my thing, which is create sketch. And you'll notice that um, it's kind of saying like, okay, cool, that's great. Where do you want to make your sketch? Uh, and I have some options, even in an empty space. Um, I can kind of draw on the front of something, the top, the bottom. Uh, and in this case, I mean, if we're making, let's just say it's a wall clock, um, the front of something is not a bad idea, right? It you know, might be hanging on a wall, so I'll click that. And now my view has kind of adjusted to a two-dimensional orthographic projection. Um, and I'm going to kind of zip through this so we can grab another challenge, if you, if you don't mind. I, Absolutely. One of my, my deepest problems with ideas is I get locked onto one and then I have to just <laughs> see it through to the end until I can like, st like start something new. So get the bear with us, but I guarantee you, we're going to learn some awesome tools because uh, we're going to do a polar array. We're going to start sketching with geometry. We'll do some editable text. We'll extrude the difference. Like it's, it's going to happen here and uh, we'll just do it nice and quick. So first thing I guess I'd want to think about is like, okay, well, what is like the average size of a wall clock? Um, you know, I have one here. Um, I also have a whole bunch of 10 inch saw blades hanging on the wall right now. <laughs> those look pretty cool. Seems I can see those from pretty far away. So let's just do 10 inches. Um, and maybe later we can serrate it and make it look a lot. Um, no, that has nothing to do with speeding up or slowing things down. Hmm. Um, uh, and then let's, uh, let's go ahead and let's just make this thing. So I'm going to finish that sketch. And you might be like, well, that's kind of boring, right? I'm making like a very kind of limited set of features here. Um, but when I extrude this object out, um, I just want to show you that when I draw a shape, as long as it's closed geometry, um, it permits me to then uh, make it into a solid object. Um, and what I'm doing is I'm pushing the E key, which stands for extrude, so I can make it into a thing. Um, and, you know, let's just say that it, well, we need some room for probably a battery or some kind of like, uh, like um, components inside. So we don't want this thing to be paper thin or else we might not be able to fit all the stuff in it. I'm choosing an analog clock uh, at this point. Uh, so inch and a half, that sounds fine. Um, and then let's, uh, you know, let's just kind of do like a couple quick little modifications to this just to show you how very quickly we can get a shape into the world that is relatively pleasing, right? So uh, I open up the fillet command, um, fun pro tip, at least either that or I've been lied to my entire life, but it's a fillet, not fillet. Um, <laughs> you know, that was at least hammered into my brain in design school. So hopefully it's true. Otherwise, man, I'm gonna have some introspection later on. But um, <laughs> we're gonna fillet this piece in and uh, yeah, yeah, something like that looks pretty good. Um, and then we're going to inset uh, this, this little um, circle in here that our numbers are going to rest in. Uh, and I could just do that by hitting extrude again and pushing it in. Uh, but that kind of gives me this weird, I don't know, coffee coaster looking thing. So um, I'm going to go ahead and create a sketch again. But this sketch has more information, right? Not only can I draw on the ground or the front of something, but I can also draw on any planar surface. So I've got a couple more options than I used to. Um, and when I do, it's going to reference that, that object. So it'll kind of tell me that it knows that this circle that I just um, referenced onto exists in the drawing already. And I can call to it as it useful information. In this case, um, if I go to modify and offset, 
I can select this edge, kind of bring it in just a tiny bit um, so I can make like a nice little reveal line. Um, I'm using imperial units and I do apologize if uh, I know millimeters are better and centimeters are great as well. Uh, but it's just, you know, I can, I can picture an eighth of an inch from a mile away uh, and I can't say the same for five millimeters. Um, so I'm gonna offset a quarter of an inch and then I'm gonna inset that just a tiny bit to give us, there we go, like a nice little thing about there, right? Now, here's the thing where it starts to relate to 3D printing and it starts to relate to how would you make something in real life? Um, if this was just super solid, not only would it be next to impossible to like install anything inside of it, but uh, it would take a lot of material to make, it'd be heavy, it'd be expensive. Um, so I'm gonna use a cool modify command called shell and I'm gonna make this thing from the backside a hollow version of itself. Um, now, it might not look like it did much, but let's see if I can make that wall thickness just a little. There we go. So now it's kind of starting to look like, so if you've ever taken a clock apart, um, this is going to start looking awfully familiar. It's going to look like it got popped out of an injection mold. Uh, actually, it's probably more of like a, a press or a forming mold of some sort. I, I think injection molding would be a waste of time for <laughs> clock manufacturing. Um, but this is now like, you know, for the strength it needs to be, it's fine. Um, and it also achieves its purpose. So if it's 0.1, you know, let's just let's go crazy and make it an eighth of an inch. <laughs> um, now I've got myself a lightweight kind of shell that um, achieves that original purpose. Still has plenty of room inside for stuff, uh, but also doesn't weigh a million pounds and take like 14 days to print, um, which actually is probably not an exaggeration. Um, so, Let's go ahead and let's add some, some content to this guy. So I'm going to go ahead and create, uh, and I'll do a new sketch right on the front here. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw a line that just comes straight up to the top here uh, that just gives me a little bit of a, a reference point. Uh, so this line doesn't really mean anything other than it helps me put things on center for this initial kind of blush at, at making um, some numbers up here. Uh, so I'm going to click it and turn it into a construction line by hitting the X key. And now it doesn't really have like geometric value. It's just kind of there for me to understand for my feeble human brain to get that I need to see the middle of this line. Um, and from there, uh, ba -ba -ba -ba, let's create another circle. And let's do a one inch circle right there. Now, some crazy blue stuff just appeared, right? Um, and what that blue stuff was telling me, if I had given it a second, was that um, as I create this circle, I have an option to either just create it wherever I want and kind of move it around and change its size kind of at will, um, or I can do kind of what Fusion would prefer me to do is add some design constraints to it. So circle, where do you want that circle, right? It's asking me those same questions. Uh, maybe in the middle of something, because I just went on for like a whole minute about how important this dotted line was. Andy, you're going to have to work with me on that one. Like, I don't know, code word is like, man, I could use some ice cream right now. It means like, <laughs> Kevin, you've been talking about dotted lines for 45 seconds. All right. Awesome. All right. So let's make this circle. And then let's be specific about how big you want it to be. So we are specific about a few things, right? It's locked to this line and it's the right size but it's still kind of proportionally adjust or it's dimensionally adjustable vertically because it's not locked to anything, which let's just say that's fine for now. Um, and then what we're gonna say, our clock goes to 11. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's too much, that's crazy talk. Um, well, I could copy this if I could, you know, divide 360 degrees by 11, um, I, could, I could get there, right? But um, almost every CAD tool this day and age has an array tool. And Fusion's no different. You can array sketch objects um, in the same way that you can array um, solid objects. They just call them patterns. So I'm going to look for circular pattern. Once again, it's like, okay, cool. What do you want to make the pattern out of? And I had this already selected, so that helps. Um, and then my center point is just going to be right there. And already, all right, full or uh, an angled um, array, so I can kind of have it go 45 degrees or something uh, if I needed to make some sort of like index, like a, a jig or a template for drawing. But we're going to go the full distance and we're going to take it up to 11. 
All right, and there we go. So finish that sketch. And then, you know, let's just, um, ooh, let's get crazy. Let's get weird. So what I'm going to do um, is I just made my 11 hand or my 11 hole clock. <laughs> um, but let's just say, I don't know, I'm going to invent like a set of adjustable emojis or icons for this thing so that if I'm, if I'm making a complex way to speed up and slow down time, maybe it's my relationship to time that needs an adjustment period. And, you know, if, if every day when the clock strikes, uh, two, <laughs> 2.375, um, that like, you know, that's actually like, you know, the time that I should be thinking about my favorite color. So I could make a, I could make an object that installs into this, that maybe threads in or something that is, uh, you know, it's color of the year, right? It's Pantone's color of the year, not, not Bear or Sherwin Williams. We're going to go to the top. Um, so let's see about making some sort of like adjustable insert into this thing, uh, because it allows us to explore more tools. And then I promise I'll stop for one second. <laughs> so um, what I'm going to do, instead of extruding these, which I could do, I could punch this out, click OK. And now I've got a hole in this thing. Um, and I could go ahead and do that a bunch of times. Um, and I can, I'm, I'm single clicking them, but there is also three different ways I could be selecting objects. It's awesome and it's crazy, but for now, I'm going to kind of be doing stuff the slow way, just so it doesn't get like super intense with the difference between a left-handed select and a right-handed select, right? You see this yellow grid, or this yellow box means something different than the orange box. We don't want to, we don't want to be like thinking about that just yet. Let's just kind of do the stuff that we know gets the job done. And those exciting kind of time savers, if time permits, we'll cover later. Uh, okay, so great. I just made my little big wheel here. Um, but what I want to do is I actually want to use a really amazing tool um, that you take for granted until you have it. Um, but you can make um, holes with some kind of specificity uh, in Fusion. And you do that by going and create a hole. Um, go figure. And uh, what you can do is you can specify just exactly what you need. So I'm going to do a simple flat hole first. And I'm going to select from my sketch as many points as I can. Did that. <laughs> there we go. Um, I don't want that one, though. You select this guy. Um, and let's change the diameter right now because I just kind of obliterated my entire project. Here we go. Um, so I've got kind of some corrections to do. Uh, delete that one, take that one away. It's kind of curious that it won't let me remove the center one. Hmm. Um, let's just give it another shot here. Select. I'll just go around it and pretend it can't see me. Now here's something interesting. So I grabbed all those circle bits, but it also grabbed this end point. Um, and what I'm going to do to deselect that is just hit shift just to get rid of it. So I don't want that there. Um, awesome. So now we've got kind of uh, these holes in a, in a different way, but I want to make them meaningful. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make them threaded. Uh, and this is super awesome. So let's just say I'm going to go to Home Depot. I'm going to buy a whole bunch of pipe threading. You know, we're going to make one of those crazy like steampunk looking thingamajiggers. So I'm going to go over to pipe threading. Um, ba, 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 da. It is ISO pipe threads. And I think, all right, well, that's interesting. Let's kind of get in there and see what's happening. Uh, let's turn on modeled so that they look awesome uh, and also can be 3D printed. Uh, and then what are we doing here? Oh, ISO is not because we are crazy people. There we go. Uh, and let's make a one inch. Now that's going to get really expensive. Let's do half inch. There we go. So half inch threaded fittings. Um, go to your hardware store and just buy those off the shelf. So we're going to make this thing compatible with those. Uh, and if I click OK, it's going to take a second because this is a lot of geometry I just created with one click. Those threads are actually modeled into this project. And because of the thread pitch on these, um, you know, if you have a high enough quality 3D printer, you can print this and it will function uh, so sometimes even without supports. 
Um, you know, if, if you, the thread pitch is a little bit too steep, you might run into some trouble, but you'd be surprised at how the resolution that can come out of something like this. But here's where my history is gonna come into play, right? Um, so this thing, I wanted to be threaded on this on the whim design decision, um, but uh, that's gonna like fall right out. If I'm using iron pipe fittings, it's just gonna tear this thing to shreds. So I'm gonna go back in time really quick and change my mind about how thick this thing is supposed to be. And let's make it another insane number, three eighths of an inch. Cross my fingers and there we go. That's much more reasonable. That's got some, it's got some hook to it. Um, so just like that, right? We can kind of go back and forth and we can, we can make adjustments to these projects um, so that this complex system of timekeeping that is outside of any national or international standard is also now modular, which is starting to really fill those cards out quite nicely, if I don't say so myself. Um, and then it's about like speeding up and slowing down. I don't know, maybe this is like the IKEA approach that like, because you have to build the clock yourself, you're actually thinking about time as you're building a device that represents time. Um, that's, that's meta enough to, to kind of say that I answered the question. Yeah. Um, or one thing we could do too is we could have uh, like possibly an oblong gear. Um, I, I don't know like the technical term for it, um, but it could be that like around two or three o'clock time goes really slow. And then like, of course the morning. Absolutely. Time. Yeah. So we could, um, that could be like a chain wheel of some sort, like, um, mm almost like a, a front chain ring on a bicycle. Uh, years and years ago, they made elliptical ones because they thought that you could get more power out of your pedal stroke as you're pushing down. <laughs> gotcha. But as you're kind of going around, it was a smaller gear ratio, but they got the, the angle of it wrong. Mm. And it just like made people's knees hurt. So they stopped <laughs> making them um, until 2010 when everything repeats itself. Um, <laughs> so anyways, uh, what's some, um, you know what? I don't know. I'm kind of, uh, I, I think that, I've got this figured out in a way that um, is, we're kind of on like cruise control right now. Um, and I'm wondering if we don't try a new design prompt as I visit, uh, make a master car here to buy myself some pipe fittings for this new clock <laughs> that I invented. Um, what I'm doing right now, just as a expose, is uh, you don't have to do all the work yourself. One of the amazing things about um, Fusion 360 is if you know what you want, um, McMaster Car has a parts library where anything on the uh, anything in the library that has product detail and a little bullseye on it, you can download as SolidWorks and step files. And when I hit save, doop, 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 doop. there we go. Thank you, Comcast. Now I've got myself a little pipe fitting that I didn't have to do all the work to make. Um, and I know for a fact I can buy a thousand more of these if I need. So another thing about Fusion that's absolutely incredible is that it doesn't want you to reinvent the wheel. Like put this thing together with nuts and bolts you can go get. You don't have to, unless you're really dying to reinvent the fastener, man, there are, there are some great fasteners out in the world and even more that we don't even know about because they're just not popular enough yet. So check first to see if there's some sort of standardized thing that um, you might be able to take advantage of. Um, select the component right there. And uh, you never know what you might find. So I'm just gonna kind of like position this and um, this might be a good time to talk about components. Hey, look at that three dimensional space. I'm gonna kind of set this up orthographically. Um, and I might, I might take this out of component drill for just one second, um, or better yet, let's put, yeah, let's put things on the line. So I, I just did that kind of the easy way and I could, I could fudge that a little bit more and get it to kind of plug in. Um, but what I really should be doing is probably telling Fusion that these things are supposed to be connected. Um, so, oh, hold on one second. Um, I, I see a question in the chat. Uh, what if you don't know what you want? Uh, you only know what you need it to do. Function with no name. That is an awesome question because uh, if I hit the S key, um, 
for design shortcuts, uh, I can start to, I don't know, like, like kind of think of like the root word for what I want to do. So like trim something down, um, uh, bu, 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 combine something. Um, let's see if I can get kind of like, yeah. So I can't just type spring, but like coil. Um, you know, I can start to cr like search for content or search for tools that um, might not be kind of like up here in front and center. They might be buried in a couple toolbars. They might even be in a different uh, modeling environment. But that S key is going to be your um, your kind of gateway to everything Fusion has to offer, even up to like the holy cow accessibility analysis. Oh, that's for CNC milling. Okay. <laughs> I was wow. going to say, that would be amazing. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, I, don't, I don't think that this is an architectural software per se, but <laughs> holy guacamole, they just went 10 years into the future. All right. Um, so yeah, S key will hook you up with a, a shortcuts menu that's searchable. And honestly, you know, like just start with the first two letters and see what, uh, what comes of it. And then worst case scenario, honest to goodness, like every once in a while, you just need to alt tab out and, and go visit a forum. Um, the Autodesk user community is it's full of super friendly folk. Um, lots of ambassadors that you know, probably are employees of Autodesk that are ready to take your questions seriously. Uh, and then, you know, it's a well-moderated forum. So even if that question has been answered a hundred times, um, you're not going to get like lambasted for, for asking it again, um, which is so something I've grown to appreciate. Uh, all righty. Let us talk about components real quick. So this thing, um, right now it's called 549K572. That's cool. Uh, that's the product number. So if I just needed to order this from McMaster Car, um, I could, if I had a bunch of these in a model, I could like right click and find out how many of these are referenced and then place the order. Um, it's pretty cool. Uh, but I'm just gonna call this pipe fitting so I know what it is. Again, sometimes my brain needs to come first. Uh, and then for this one, uh, right now, it's called body two, and we'll just call this uh, face. And we have one thing that's kind of outside of the browser right now. Um, you know, if, if I've got a body here that's called a, that's called face, and it's been all the things we've been working on, this kind of this guy kind of exists outside of it. He's what's called a component, um, and he lives kind of independently of the, the this clock thing that we're working on. Um, what that means is, uh, if I make modifications to it independently, um, let's capture that position. Like, let's just kind of go nuts and, I don't know, make it a part that I can't buy in a store. Um, it's not going to interfere with the rest of the model, but it's also self-referential. So if I make an array of those um, and I change one, it's like a CAD block. It'll change all of them, uh, which I'll demonstrate in a second. But first, I think what I'd like to do is I'm going to move this guy out of here. Uh, and I'm going to turn my face into a component. OK, I can't. I got to call it clock face because no. <laughs> uh, OK, there we go. All right. Let's go ahead and create components from bodies. Yes, please. So now I've got two things that are considered components. And why might I want to do that? Well. Fusion also has kind of this neat assembly dialogue that um, is it's very similar to Autodesk Inventor. Uh, SolidWorks has similar functionality. Um, honestly, like even 3D Studio Max has some, some of this integration of like getting things to relate to each other, like creating a bone structure for animation or something. Um, and in Fusion, it's all called joints. Uh, so joining things together. Uh, and that's in the assemble category. So we've kind of covered create, we've covered modify, we've covered, and now we're about to cover assemble. How do I put this thing together that I'm making? Um, which is comprised of two things. So I really hope this is like a walk in the park. Uh, otherwise, I don't know, we might just start a different project because I'll get, <laughs> I'll get embarrassed. But all right, here we go, here we go. Um, all right, so assemble. Let's just join something together. Some components have moved. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, what it's asking me when I, when I do this is, um, because it's an object that is kind of already been defined somewhere else, every time I move it, it 
hasn't actually moved itself. Like if I had designed this little plumbing fitting in a, a, in like a new project and saved it and then brought it in, I'm not I'm not changing it over here. It's just its relationship to my other project is changing. So it always asks you to either capture or revert position. Um, and honestly, if you just click no, you'll see what happens in most edits. But let's try and join. Uh, sure. Ah, see, there we go. Where'd it go? Let's go capture position. And right now, the joint dialog pops up and say, all right, what do you want to join? Um, this is one of those things, this is one of those moments where generally speaking, I like to, um, um, well, look up the documentation because I, I tend to forget which one comes first. It's not a chicken or egg thing. I think you attach com a component to your project and not the other way around. So that's what I'm gonna try and do first. All right, there we go. And ah, here we go. Kind of like, uh, kind of freaks out on you. That means good things are happening, believe it or not. It is telling me that it has welded itself in place in this project. Uh, and it hasn't done so perfectly, right? Like it's meant to be threaded in place. So what I'm gonna do before I hit okay, is I'm just gonna push this back a little bit to an acceptable depth um, and make sure that we're at, well, what do you know? Offset 0.375 should about cut it. Cool, so that sits about flush. Uh, and I'm gonna go ahead and click OK. And now these two pieces are connected to one another. Um, so if, if I try to move one, the whole project comes with. Um, so that's pretty useful. And uh, you know, if I wanted to kind of replicate that, um, Let's see if I can't uh, make a pattern of this guy. So create pattern, circular pattern. Pattern of what? Pattern of components. This one, where's my axis? It's right there. How many of these? 11. Cool. So there we have it. Um, you know, we've... <laughs> What do we have? I don't know. Um, <laughs> but uh, let's go ahead and uh, let's make something kind of cool that kind of fits on these things. So we've got, a, we've got all these 11 pipe fittings. And I think what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna activate one of them. And I'm gonna go in and I'm gonna create a new object just to kind of illustrate, hopefully illustrate how convenient this can be to create some new content uh let's do 1.5 and let's make it there we go 0.5 we're making like uh now it's starting to look like a uh, a bolt uh, and what and what i just say about not reinventing the wheel but uh, anyways <laughs> um but what you'll notice is if i go back to this project um they've all updated with that feature um, because if I've changed one component, they all have to, because they're all pipe fittings, they all have to do what I say. So let's go back in here and uh, let's create a quick sketch in this and let's offset this to about there. Okay, let's stop that sketch. We'll extrude that in just a tiny bit. Cool. And then what we'll do is one more sketch. And here's where we're gonna bring it all home. Let's create some text. Number, uh, let's make that five. Oh no, bigger. Not that big. <laughs> hey. Um, oh, and it's it's being a jerk. It's telling me that I, I kind of chose to place it somewhere without me realizing it. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, try that again. Get some text where this time I'll be smart and put it where I actually want it to be. Here we go. Um, oh, never mind. Yep. So 
fun thing about design constraints is I don't actually have an accurate location for this. Um, it's a little bit arbitrary uh, and that's okay because not all numbers are the same, right? Um, so I want my symbol to be, oh, now you're just, now you're just not being fair. <laughs> and the rest of the day is spent trying <laughs> to get the number. Here we go. Perfect. Height one. Fold. No. Font. Sure. <laughs> okay. Okay. Sorry, that took forever, but I'm going to go ahead and locate that where I want. When I finish this sketch, go back to the whole project. That editable copy is available on all of my folds. Now, I might have to do a little bit of magic here to get that sketch to be independently editable, ed editable but I'm going to try it anyways and see what, yeah, what happens here. Um, we're going to sketch. Let's go ahead and um, break one of these away from its friends. Um, all components, selectable, unselectable. Uh oh. <laughs> well, maybe I maybe I won't do that right now, but. Um, what I would obviously want to do is, is remove this sketch from its kind of parent here and maybe put it into the master project so that I can edit it later, uh, which would allow me to change those numbers independently and then extrude them. Um, otherwise, I might have to create some sort of a, uh, a independent array that is individual numbers. Hmm. So. Um, in any case, let's uh, let's continue. Let's uh, let's go ahead and just screw one of these. <laughs> um, and let's create a few few more holes here. Uh, Another way we could look at it, uh, maybe maybe we reimagine those hashtag symbols or number symbols. Um, in order to be fences. And so in order to slow down time, we're actually like caging the time in this clock. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> I, I love it. Um, and then, you know, just because we can, we're going to go back and um, project in this circle. And we'll just draw ourselves like a, a cool looking um, squiggly little clock arrow, just so I can showcase one more tool. Um, well, as this thing goes around, it might collide with this guy over here. So I'm just gonna rein it in a little bit. Um, this starts to kind of look like Adobe Illustrator, which is kind of fun. Um, you basically have Bezier curves that are adjustable. Um, you can change the kind of tangent curve uh, and also the kind of the length of each handle. Uh, and then also move them around at will unless they're locked to something. So that's kind of kind of nice. Uh, we'll finish that, and let's go ahead and create a pipe around this object. Make this a new body that is square, and it is twenty-five. Fun. All right, and then let's just move that out. All right, so, you know, now we're illustrating how to use sweeps and lofts and things like that. Um, and even this object here, as, as silly as it is, is also adjustable. So we can kind of turn this into a little point. And make ourselves a clock hand out of this crazy object.
create poll here. Oh, what do you know? Thank you. And I want that to be about a quarter of an inch. So now all we need to do is install some hardware. Um, you know, I, I imagine that this is way too thick for one of those like hobby clock kits to fit in. Um, so what I'm going to do is create a, a new rectangle, but we're going to use it in a different way. We'll create a center rectangle. It's right about there. Finish that sketch. We'll extrude this in. Um, just enough so that there's still some material there, but we're not killing the whole thing with, uh, there we go. Oh, looks like I made a mistake there. We're kind of interfering with one of our uh, hardware pieces. So we'll edit that sketch a tiny bit. And we'll just make this a tiny bit smaller. Yeah, then. There we go. All right. Round it out. Um, and this, again, just to make things 3D printer friendly, what I'm going to do is I'm going to chamfer some of these inside edges here so that I can kind of have a little bit of a nice inside corner. I don't know if any of you have ever done a 90 degree inside corner on things, but they have a tendency to be either a stress riser or just not even like a clean edge. So, all right. So <laughs> we have made, um, might be the most unusual project I've ever put together uh, in Fusion 360, but um, you know, using a bizarro set of design prompts, we've gotten kind of the, the first version of something out into the world. And, this is as good a time as any to point out that when you're working with random ideas and you're just kind of being creative, um, ideas can be pretty ugly uh, and that's okay. Um, the first idea that you come up with might not be the prettiest. Uh, and what you know, our mission at Bitspace often is, um, is to help kids kind of like realize their goals and refine as you go. So, you know, there's always opportunity for improvement when you're working in 3D modeling software. And you don't always have to get it right the first time. And what Fusion is so great is it allows us to kind of learn from our mistakes, but also make adjustments to our project without losing any progress. So I think that's a really cool and exciting feature that we don't often get to talk about. Absolutely. It's also such a great uh, tool to, as you were saying when we were just getting started, um, was you can, we, we at Bitspace like to, uh, of course, when we have projects, start with a drawing. Um, and in 3D modeling, like sometimes those ideas can be um, a bit complex um, for the student or camper to express. And uh, being able to actually sketch those in this program is an awesome way to sort of like meet them in the middle and teach uh, teach uh, how the software actually works while you're uh, designing your uh, your project idea. Um, now, I actually have no concept of time right now, but something tells me that we went a little longer than we anticipated. Um, but um, you know, where it's, are we at with the? It is five thirty right now. Five twenty nine. Oh. Um, excellent. Well, let's take a pause and let's see if anyone has any questions about this insanity that I'm going to try and polish up into a nice looking product in the remainder of our time. Um, have you seen any questions come in? Uh, I think that we are all caught up thus far. All right. Um, well, let us continue. Um, 
I think we, we've got uh, we've got a half an hour left. Mm -hmm. So um, maybe this is a good opportunity to get serious and try to make something that is a little bit beyond the whimsical. What do you What do you think? Okay. All right. Sounds so let's uh, let's let's get another idea jam going. And this time, um, see, pending no no questions or, or submittals, let's just uh, let's do the card challenge again. <laughs> um, okay, design something for the kitchen that is useful and involves light. Let us see what we can do. Mm -hmm. So let's just save this as um, Useful in kitchen light and yeah, that's it. Okay. So what are some things that come to mind when we're thinking about useful in the kitchen and and what if we get beyond the kitch? Like what 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 is a useful thing that is you know it involves illumination or in some way can help us make our lives a little bit better hmm. um you know i can think of a few things um you know let's let's just say let's kind of like pop a user into our into our minds of you know someone who's you know they're working at home they've got a lot to do like you barely remember that you put the, the tea kettle on right um you know, so you're making dinner, um, there's like, you know, you're a family of, of four and there's, you know, you have kids running around. There's probably like a, like a, I don't know, let's just say there's even like a St. Bernard in the mix that's just like knocking stuff over whenever it feels like. And like, how do we, how do we make something using this design prompts that might help that person? Like, let's, I mean, that's not me. I'm not describing myself, <laughs> but like, um, if I was that person, like what, what things would benefit me um, in, in a way that might not be like thought of before. And like one of the, one of the things that comes to my mind um, is uh, like, like the novelty of like a water boiler, a, a kettle that like you turn on and within seconds you've got boiling water. Um, and uh, I, I have one, I inherited one actually, that um, when it's on, it lights up. Mm -hmm. But that's it like so that that's cool um but how can we turn lighting up into utility it's kind of where my brain's going andy what do you think uh i agree uh someone in the comments wrote uh, a pan lid that has a light or a pan lid that uh lights up like you were saying say when water yes boils. So, absolutely or like I'm, maybe I'm when this. you're uh searing a, a a piece of meat uh you can see when it actually reaches that uh that uh, critical temperature and might not be able to read the inside temperature, but uh, yeah, it at but least like gives you, you can put some idea. kind of like sensors in that have like a, a pan temperature. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I do. I love the idea of having some sort of um, you know, it'd almost be like a little vibration detector or something, um, or I guess it could be an internal temperature of the lid that lets you know that your water's reached its boiling point. Mm. And because we live in the future, we could get that device to send us a text message. Like that's what's insane about this is like this product, this idea that just came out of our heads could be real and <laughs> could be useful to people in this wonderful kind of internet of things universe that we can all live in. And honestly, I could probably mod this with some expertise, right? Because waterproof electronics is not my forte. Mm -hmm. um, not, not, not to mention heat and steam resistant waterproof. <laughs> but I could get together a couple people and for maybe 25 bucks, we could have a prototype of this thing out into the world. Um, I'm, I'm loving that. Let's kind of see where we can take that. Uh, light up when water boils with an eye. Oh, yeah. Oh, nice. The IR sensors. Um, some idea that tells you when the stove is left on or cooled off. That's another oh, great yeah. one. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, it kind of just lets you know, like, it's a little ambient temperature sensor. Mm -hmm. That could be linked up to, um, you know, not let's why stop there. It's like your stove, your furnace, your water heater, um, you know, a little uh, light sensor to make sure that the pilot lights on on mm -hmm. your, your water heater. 
yeah. like all of these devices could be linked up in some sort of sweet mesh network. Um, I've been reading a lot about particle lately, so I'm obsessed with like, um, you know, getting getting a, like a machine to ring my doorbell with a servo whenever <laughs> I like tap on a button on my smartphone. Um, let's see. Uh, lights that protect to... children from hot things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, the photon. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, so yeah, so these are a lot of great ideas. And, and it doesn't necessarily have, have to mean that we reinvent um, the wheel. But because I want to show off a couple other tools that this brings to mind, I am going to draw a, a pan or a, okay. a, 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 a saucepan. Um, we could probably go to like Le Creuset or um, uh, buh, 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 Kitchen Aid or something like that, and they might have you know like technical drawings of these products. Mm. That's usually only for like technology and stuff. But I wouldn't be surprised if somebody's made a three-dimensional model of your favorite like Le Creuset like sauce like uh, frying pan or something. Uh, but what we can do is we can talk about the uh, sketch tool as it relates to the revolve tool. So I'm going to create a new sketch real quick, and um, I'm going to go ahead and do a center rectangle again. Yeah, uh, and we're going to we're going to kind of estimate the volume of or the the area of a cross section of a saucepan. So, um, Andy, real quick, yes, um, do you have a saucepan in front of you? I can grab one. Well, how how big? <laughs> if you can see one, like how okay. tall are these? Like, it's like you know, seven inches, something like that. Say yeah, six six or seven inches. Yeah. Okay, and then the diameter of these puppies is right around like ten. I'm thinking. Um, yeah. You start to get into like uh, like stew pot level if you go bigger than that. Yeah. Like ten inches <laughs> in diameter. Okay. Um, now from here. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw a line right down the middle of this sketch, but it's not just going to be for my own benefit this time. We're going to do something pretty cool. Um, let's extend that line down. And uh, what we're going to do is I'm just going to think a couple of th few things and stuff about what pans actually look like. Generally speaking, um, if they're vertical and have tight angles, you'd never get them clean. So I know that they have rounded edges. So this isn't the condition of a saucepan. It's actually something probably more like this. Now, I'm not going to be arbitrary about it. I'm going to say I've got my caliper or my, my uh, protractor out and it's actually an 85 degree angle. Um, and I can lock angles the same way I lock dimensions. I'm going to go ahead and click there. And now this dimension and this line is locked to the height of the pan. So if this thing is bigger or smaller, that kind of shrinking and, and growing is all still constrained in that way. Um, but I'm going to kind of break some of that by trimming that line off so that when it comes down to getting this thing into a, a workable object, um, all I have to do is do what's called a revolve. So I'm going to fill it this the way I would fill it three-dimensional geometry. And I'm working on the outside of the pan right now. So I want to make sure that when I make this thing thick, it actually um, still has a nice inside corner. So I think 0.5 should cut it. Uh, and then I'm just going to kind of trim away some of this stuff. Um, this starts to get into like AutoCAD tactics, which you can, you can see like Fusion is getting real grumpy with me. It's like, why are you, uh, we just made all this. Why are you getting rid of it? Because <laughs> sometimes I know what a saucepan looks like, Fusion. All right, I don't, I don't need, I don't need your help. I do. I actually do it neat all the time. But in this particular case, I don't because um, this isn't the most important part of the project. So um, I'm going to offset this guy in the thickness of a aluminum pan. Let's just say we don't want to make our first pro. Well, let's make it copper. Why not? Infinite time, money. We're, we're all set. <laughs> so I don't know. They're not an eighth of an inch thick, but are they about a sixteenth of an inch thick? Um, we probably want to know what metal gauge is. Um, there's, a, there's charts for that kind of stuff. Um, and these are those moments in, in a student project that are actually the most fun for me is getting to say, I don't know. Uh, and then we just go explore like what metal gauge means. Like everyone's heard it somewhere in their life or um, they've, they've looked at a sheet of tin foil and wondered like, man, how thick is that? Well, there's, there's spec sheets for that. And we can find out down to the micron how this stuff is made and learn something together. And so material science kind of like 
gets written out on PDFs all the time for us to, to find and have fun with. Um, but that's enough, I think, information to get myself a vessel. So I'm going to finish this up, and then I'm going to go to Create, and then I'm going to go ahead and Revolve this guy. And what Revolve does is it takes a closed profile, like this guy, uh, and it spins it around an axis to make a solid thing. Um, so you can already tell that I went a little heavy on the height, right? Like this thing isn't, isn't exactly perfect, but we'll fix that in a second. But now we've got ourselves, you know, a little, little saucepan with no lid. Um, so let's create a lid next. Um, let's go ahead and we'll create a sketch on top of this guy. Nope, I was just kidding. Go ahead and create a sketch on top of, maybe I have to say it with like a little bit more. Oh, I know what's happening. <laughs> I'm, I'm just doing something wrong here. Uh, let's go back to this sketch. Oh, that's the one with nothing on it. Let's go back here. And uh, it, was, it was looking for a coplanar surface. And uh, if you notice, I didn't provide it one. Um, I guess I should have listened to all those warnings that Fusion was giving me. It probably had something important in there to tell me. Uh, but now I should be able to kind of fix this up. So finish the sketch. And let's go ahead and draw something on the top of that. So I can choose, even though this is like a ring, I can also choose the top of a saucepan as a surface to draw on. And why might I want to do that uh, in this particular case? So I can use my offset tool to kind of create that, um, that seal that we're going to want that goes into the pan just ever so slightly. Uh, and then the, the, the rim that kind of comes out ever so slightly. Yeah, and then we're going to do one more here because if they are exactly coplanar, Crazy things happen, right? That's so that's such a tight fit that you'd never get the lid off as soon as like the heat turned up, or as soon as it cooled down, you'd never be able to get the lid off. So um, let's go minus point two. All right, that's that's looking about right now. There's a lot of a lot of to do for a lot of nothing, but this is I'm going to recycle a sketch. So I'm going to I'm going to make uh, one shape first. My sketch is going to disappear on me, and that's fine. But I'm going to bring it back so that I can also take it and extrude the rest of it. Oh. Perfect. New body, because I don't yet want to join things. Cool, so now I've got three, three things in my model. I've got the main body, which is the, the pot, and then I've got kind of this ring that's going to be my lid. And I'm going to go ahead and turn off that, because I don't need it yet, and I'm going to combine these two shapes into the lid, or at least the beginning of it. Uh, and then I'm gonna go ahead and, da, 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 da. Oh, I do like some sort of a dome thing here. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and create another sketch and I'm gonna project in this whole thing, click in that okay action, and then let's draw a line that is, I don't know, that seems about right. What do you think? Yeah. Okay. One inch up. Um, and then what I'd like to do is let's see if I can't project in this extra bit here. And this, this might not help me, but let's see if I can now draw a line that is relative to that so that I can make a three-point arc that kind of gets me where I'm needing to go. So I'm going to go ahead and create, and I'm going to create an arc. Uh, I believe it's end, middle. No, just kidding. It's <laughs> end, end, middle. Think, think, think. Excellent. Uh, we'll go ahead and offset that a little bit. Yeah. Okay. Now, some some fun things are happening, kind of inside of this geometry. Let's just turn this off so we can see. Um, once again, Fusion's trying to help me out, and for the most part, it's it's working. 
But it's also kind of told me something about the error in my ways. I think what I'm going to want to do is offset this uh, to the outside. Mm -hmm. So I don't get that crazy intersection. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of like follow Fusion's lead here and set myself up with a cross section um, that allows me to simultaneously revolve this thing, but kind of cut into the lid as if like the glass sits and gets like glued to some sort of like adhesive or something. So uh, stop that. Uh, we're gonna go ahead and create a revolve out of, out of what? That and that part there. Um, for my axis, we're going to choose the center line. Cool little UFO here. <laughs> uh, I'm going to click OK. And uh, I'm going to turn back on my lid body and modify. But this time, instead of joining them, I'm actually going to cut. Uh, and I'm going to cut this ring with this tool body. But turn on Keep Tools so nothing happens or did it, right? So now I've got this lid and this dome, but I've got this cool little channel in here that represents my, uh, my socket to receive this, this little piece of acrylic or uh, it would have to be Pyrex or something. Um, but now we get to talk about materials and start playing around with appearances because I would like it to be as kind of authentic looking as possible. Um, I am gonna choose uh, polycarbonate just because visually it, it still represents pretty well as like a solid surface. Um, the one thing that's amazing about Fusion though is it does know what materials are. Um, if I say this thing's made of steel and I run it through some finite element analysis, it's gonna treat it like it was made out of steel. Uh, and so you can, you can actually engineer something down to how much it weighs. Um, and if you were in um, Jeremy's Ultimaker uh, uh, Cura talk earlier, uh, where you can start to estimate like the cost and time of, of prints. Um, this software is also able to help you with that information at a material level all the way down to, I think it knows like the weight of like, uh, like maple and things like that, plus or minus, but um, mostly metals, aluminum, steel, stuff like that. Um, it can, it can understand that we're making this thing out of real world materials and provide kind of real world feedback, um, which is, you know, hours of incredible content that we don't have time for to explore just yet. <laughs> uh, and then let's make this uh, thing out of stainless steel, shall we? So uh, stainless, um, sure, brushed steel. Um, oh, that's why it asked me to do that. <laughs> Kevin, it's your first day. There we go. Okay. So we've got our lid, we've got our pot. Oh, charming. Um, and uh, let's just say that like the magic is in kind of the, the, the device we need to, to sense temperature, right? This isn't gonna be an ordinary pot. And this might be a time to start thinking about how, um, let's just say it needs to hold, still needs to hold a liter of liquid or some sort of standard unit of measure. Um, we don't want to start putting a bunch of um, equipment in here, taking up the space, but we might have to, um, to get this device to work. But it might be something where it's actually like a universal attachment that, that takes place mm. in the handle that provides kind of all of the data and all the feedback. Um, and all you have to do is, um, well, all you have to do is cut the rivets off your pot handles and, and stamp new ones on. I mean, come on. <laughs> Everybody has a press in their, in their kitchen. That's what I've heard. <laughs> um, but let's go ahead and um, let's start thinking about like the smart handle um, as, a, uh, as an object. So you know, we'll just create another sketch here and I'll project in some of this content that is interesting to me and important. Um, and the reason to do that is because now I can, I can use it for things. So, um, you know, again, like just starting with something simple, like um, how, like what is like the general amount of space we'd want a handle to take up? Um, you know, if it has a curve to it, where does it start and stop? Um, 
that's probably somewhere in there. Uh, and then, you know, we can offset that handle and provide it some thickness. Um, ba -ba -ba -da -ba -ba. Three eighths is, is always a friendly number. Um, and then, yeah, let's do a, let's spice it up a little bit and do a spline, shall we? So we'll do some nice kind of flowing little piece of geometry over here. Um, sure, I like that. Oh, um, all right. So, uh, all right, we've got our thing. Let's draw our line. Um, I just uh, I got uh, the Academy Awards. Like I just heard the orchestra start to warm up. <laughs> so I gotta, I gotta get moving here if we're gonna have a meaningful model. Man, why do you spend so much time? I told you, man. I'm, I, I'm interested. I'm in the mood for ice cream. <laughs> was the hey, working on, working on imaginary clock projects all day. Um, <laughs> go ahead and offset this guy just a tiny bit. Sure. Um, and then I'm gonna go ahead and do something a little magical here that I'll show you why I did that in just a second, hopefully. Um, sure, so I've got enough to create kind of the, the beginnings of a handle here. Um, yeah, let's go ahead and extrude some of this stuff out. Everything I want to be a part of the handle gets extruded. Um, let's remove that so we have kind of like a comfortable grip. Uh, and instead of extruding this in one direction, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a symmetric extrusion so that I can provide width to the handle. Now, we'll take care <laughs> of what's happening here in just a second. Uh, I'm not too worried about that. Um, but what I wanted to show you, I added that little, that little extra tang there. Um, you know, I used to watch QVC growing up. I know what the tang is. I don't know, it's that awesome kitchen knife set you can never afford. Um, that little extra bit of geometry, I can will into a gusset by just filleting that out. And that's why I included that, was so that now I have kind of like a nice solid connection to this. Well, I don't yet, but I will have a nice <laughs> solid connection to this pot. Um, but then also that starts to get me asking myself, where on earth am I gonna put like any sensing equipment, right? Um, the upper third of this pot might not be enough. We might need to kind of bring something down uh, along the side here. And in order to do that, we're going to want to start working with construction planes. And this will be probably the last new set of tools I introduce. Um, long story short, uh, right now I've, I've kind of convenienced myself by working with kind of the origin points of a model. Uh, which are, you know, it's like the zero, zero, zero of the world. But, um, you know, just like with other modeling software, you can, you can work anywhere. And if you know how to get a construction plane handy, um, you know, you can start to create meaningful construction planes that are relative to other parts of your project. So if I make a 95 degree angle at the edge of this handle, and I create a sketch on that plane, everything that I draw from here on out is going to be kind of skewed at that angle, mm. which is going to be, is going to be useful. Um, I'll go ahead and uh, just turn that construction plane back on and let's offset it just a little bit. Okay. Um, and then let's create another sketch. Uh, and we're going to project in that rectangle that I just drew and then offset it inward ever so slightly. Shazam. Okay. And it's that sketch. Uh, and then just for laughs, we're going to use one last tool. And I promise that would be the last one. <laughs> we're going to use a loft tool because this is, um, I didn't necessarily believe in loft as like the right answer for a lot of a lot of tools or a lot of ideas uh, when like you know, sweep and revolve were kind of more controllable 
and um, early early 3D modeling software, lofting would just, you know, I, I swear that that's how like half of like the fun looking architecture projects happen is you just try to loft two random things together and like when it folds itself in half and creates <laughs> like a space time continuum like warp zone, you're like, I did it. You know, that that's that's my project right there. Uh, and, and Fusion 360's loft is it's just a lot more sensible. Um, you have your profiles like you always do. Uh, and then the kind of options in which you use those profiles are all provided. Even, um, you know, if you want to use a center rail instead of perimeter rails to guide the shape um, so that you can have multiple sections and have kind of a, a snake-like object that changes shape over the length of a guide rail. Uh, all that's included in like these really easy buttons to push. But for what I, I all I want to do is just create my sensor housing. Um, and then I'm rushing. So this isn't centered or anything. But I wanted to join that. So we've got kind of a meaningful like amount of space to put stuff in. But then it can't look bad either. So we have to kind of like round this out just a touch. Um, yeah, so that's starting to look interesting. And then um, I'm going to go ahead and move uh, a join. What if I, you and you, we're going to join you up. And then I'm going to move it ever so slightly back. Oh, I see what I did. Join. This this. Don't keep the tools. OK. Um, I had keep tools turned on, which is why I ended up with bonus content there. Um, go ahead and remove that. Uh, note that I'm going to use the remove option, not the delete option. I'm going to pull that back just a tiny little bit. Uh, and for, I guess, the final trick of the day, I'm going to do my best to extrude this crazy shape. And instead of giving it an arbitrary distance, I'm going to extrude it to object. And I'm going to try to extrude it to this, which it looks like it executed perfectly. Uh, but I want to join it. It's just a new one. And then I'll combine those two things together. Um, and then last but not least, let's just give it like kind of a separation here. That was weird. Oh man. Oh man, We're running out of time. <laughs> running out of time. I can feel it. There we go. Awesome. So what that did, just to show you, is um Turn off all my sketches. It automatically rounded that edge condition to make perfectly with the ever-changing radius of the container. So when you extrude something to an object, it does all the hard work for you. You don't have to like extrude it past that object and then trim it and cut it apart and then glue it all back together. That extrude to object function is just absolutely incredible for saving time um, and effort. And, um, you know, we didn't necessarily get to a, I think, a good stopping point on this project, but this is something that, like, I think has a real world value and it has a really solid relationship to a series of problems and maybe concerns that kind of showed up in the chat. It started to mm -hmm. resonate with people. And that's how you know you're onto an idea. And, um, you know, sometimes, sometimes that idea is, you know, how, how do I teach physics to online? Um, and it's like, well, you know, why don't we 3D model like the world's heaviest object? And, you know, we can start talking about mass and we can start talking about force and stress uh, by building things and seeing whether or not they fall down. Um, it, it, I don't know. It's just there's so many available options in the infinite variety of space that something like Fusion 360 provides uh, that it can almost be overwhelming, right? Overwhelmed by infinite potential. Um, but tying it back to a prompt or an idea or a curriculum agenda that you really want to explore and you just don't have the room to like, you know, you don't, you can't, you don't have anything to take out of the closet anymore. Mm -hmm. um, there's this kind of like closet of infinite curiosities in these modeling programs that let you kind of make content to explore. Um, and Andy, I think that's kind of like your specialty, you know? Abs yeah, I was gonna say like, even even if you're not even um, 
if you yourself are not familiar with this and say you want to teach a class um, using this space, uh, it's such an awesome, like sometimes frustrating, yes, as you're learning, but as you uh, learn with your class, literally just exploring the tools, the way the tools interact with objects which you've made, um, it's such a great conversation starter. And even in uh, the short time that we had today, we were able to uh, explore two very different projects and uh, give them both, like even though we didn't get to finish them both, um, a, uh, a due diligence and an, uh, a larger exploration than, okay, make X or Z. Um, what if we tried to make something that would represent this uh, abstract concept? Uh, how can we do that? And with just like 10 minutes of discussion, we were able to launch into a world of possibility. Um, and not even, of course, just with the presenters uh, here, we were, we were utilizing our, um, our participant, uh, participants. Um, and that's, that's where the fun begins. But yeah, um, it could yeah, have said if, better. Uh, if, if you uh, are curious more about BitSpace, uh, feel free to give our website uh, a look see uh, if you're a parent looking for your student to get uh, involved with uh, 3D modeling or 3D printing. Um, uh, BitSpace is a great resource for that. Uh, or if you're an educator trying to uh, integrate this into your um, uh, content and your classroom, uh, we also have some uh, great professional development. Um, uh, we are uh, we just released one with uh, 3D Universe and Enable. Um, it is a fantastic course of engineering human-centered design challenges. Um, it's some awesome content. Um, I'll post a link to our website in the chat. Um, yeah, if anyone has any other questions, uh, feel free to fire those off uh, real quick. Uh, yeah, please. I'm happy to stick around uh, in spite of my long-windedness. If you guys have questions or uh, just want any information uh, explained further, uh, I'd be delighted to, to help. Well, Andy, Kevin, I want to thank you for a great session. Uh, we're certainly fine if, if you'd like to hang out here for a couple minutes, see if any other questions come in, but I know I enjoyed it. So thanks for taking the time to do this today. Oh, yeah, no problem. Uh, it was, it was excited, exciting to see what comes out of the cards. And, um, you know, just like any idea, you don't know it's a bad idea until you know it's a bad idea. And <laughs> it was nice to be able to walk through two projects, um, you know, invest kind of enough time in one to realize that it really isn't going to take us anywhere uh, and then get to the one that has meaning and value to more people uh, and in a lot of respects like that's the design process in its beautiful nutshell yeah. um, knowing knowing when to call it because you're just not onto something and trying again and, and learning from your mistakes and you know iterate until eureka mm -hmm. right so. And, I, and I love, as you put it, the, the time travel features that Fusion offers where you can go back and make changes and have it flow back up through, through time to the, to the rest of your design. It's very powerful. Yeah. Agreed. Um, and uh, yeah, was, thanks so much for setting all this up for us, Jeremy. I had a really fun time. Yeah, and, thank um, you. Yeah, been... we'll know, yeah, we'll know, we'll know a good idea when we see it next time. So I'm excited <laughs> to keep doing these sessions. And uh, I just put a link again into the chat there for you guys, that uh, URL where you will find all of the recordings for this and all of the other sessions that we've done in this recent series. So check that page out tomorrow and we should have the recording from this one up there, but there's already recordings from all the other sessions we've done over the last week. So there's some great content on that page for you to check out. Thanks everyone for joining. Awesome, thank yeah. you again. Thanks so much for uh, taking time to spend with us today. Bye everyone. <laughs>